Um, welcome. Thank you guys. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to share what I've learned over the years from, from a, a plenty, plenty of people. Um, I'll jump right into it. I think I have maybe, uh, maybe too much, hopefully not too much, but uh, at any point, if you guys have questions for me, please, uh, please shoot them. I'll stop. I'd rather answer your questions uh, than go through the whole PowerPoint. Um, I think that's a little bit more informative. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it. Is everything good with the, sh the screen share? You bet. Looks great, Coach. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, let's jump into them. My topic today is obviously player development, and I think it's really, really important with the player development side just to, you know, continue to talk about how it impacts offense and defense um, and overall help your team. I mean, the, the root of everything is going to start with your player development and how your players develop. So um, first things first, <clears throat> overall, I'm going to cover today building a player. I'm going to touch on as well as a little bit about constructing a workout at the end. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can cover player development. And I think with time today, I think we're going to try and focus a lot more on how we build a player. Okay. The first thing, the first thing is why. Um, this is the best question that can be asked or you need to understand and know why you're doing something. I think this, this thing uh, answers questions and validates your credibility. Um, the smartest players on your team are going to ask this question. Um, and when you're building a drill and you're trying to construct something for your team um, to do, or your player individually, you need to answer this question, why? Um, a company, it's IDEO, it's, it's a, they design systems. It's a world leading company, a uh, fortune 500 company. I think the company was the first one to um, develop the mouse for Apple. So when they bring these uh, new systems to the table and they're thinking about how they're going to incorporate it and they're, they're dealing with a lot of problem solving. One of the things they answer or they ask is why, but not only once they ask it five times because they feel like asking the question why five times, they'll get to the root of what is really at hand. For instance, um, I say, you know, why do you exercise? And then you might say, because it's healthy. And then I say, well, why do you think it's healthy? And then you might say, well, it's going to boost up my heart rate. Um, <clears throat> I said, why is that important? And then you might say, uh, well, if I boost up my, my uh, heart rate, I'm going to burn more calories. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to lose weight. And so why is it so important for you to lose weight? Well, society puts a lot of pressure on me. Uh, I feel like a society puts a lot of pressure on me to lose weight and look fit. So that, that is the root of everything. And I think that when you're going through those steps and building drills and building a player and building um, certain things that will help you translate to the game, you have to be able to answer that. Okay, going through these steps of building a player, um, I'll, try, I'll, I'll cover these as much as possible. All right, so there's going to be the evaluation, um, the fundamentals, skill acquisition, decision-making, quantifying skills, as well as movement and strength. First piece, evaluation. We must see the athlete play. This is, before you start working with somebody, that natural feel of what they do and the areas of improvement need to come from seeing the player play, all right? Um, or else we'll just start to impose our own will or impose things that we think every player needs without even understanding how good that player is, okay? So what I like to do is I like to watch them on film or go see them play. Um, or if I was dealing with a youth level, I, you know, I get to play them one-on-one. -on -one. I'll mess around with them and try to see what are the things that um, this athlete is good or bad at.
Here we have, this is some Canadian content here. Um, Shea Gildas Alexander. So I'm watching this clip. The ball's kind of moving across the top and it gets to Shea. Shea catches and holds. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jot down that Shea is not playing off the catch. You know, we like players to play off the catch um, with, in the Hornets, we're talking about 0.5 decision making. Um, the national team, when I've worked with Team Canada and growing up the youth in, in, in Canada, we talk about making quick decisions and playing off the catch. So this is something I would jot down automatically that he needs to improve. Okay, going through that, you can see right here, he makes a pretty good field read on Brandon Clark, another Canadian, not really going to contest the shot because he was worried about Muscala's shooting. So automatically now I, I know that Shea has feel. He has feel for where the defenders are and what the defenders are worried about driving to the rim. So I've jotted down a positive as well as a negative for things to harp on. When I'm talking about skill, skill development, I'm looking at this Shea shooting off the dribble. Okay, as I'm going through this, I'm seeing Okay, low is not a great base. It's pretty slow, not a lot of elevation. That's what I would look at. And so I'm gonna jot these things down for a player and now go through that. And when we're in our player development series um, and we're working out, whether it's before practice, after practice, coming back at night, we are harping on things that we are seeing on film. Fundamentals. Going through these things of building a player, we talk about all these things. We try to touch these things all the time. Ball handling, passing, finishing, and, and shooting. All these things we're trying to touch and make sure um, the players are trying to get better at that. With that, we have to build in is the skill acquisition. Okay, so, so how do we get the players to um, really get what we're trying to teach them how do we uh, get them better in specific areas? And I love to use analogies. Analogies for me is one of the best ways of getting players to really understand what I'm talking about or what I'm thinking. Um, for instance, here I, I use high five. So high five for me is a floater. Uh, when a guy's driving to the paint and he gets to the rim and he kind of high fives the rim rather than flicking his wrist. I think flicking your wrist is more of a runner. Again, that's just my opinion. Um, but I try to use that analogy so that it sticks in the player's hand, um, head in terms of how they're going to do these things. Another one would be hitting your head. Um, hitting your head, like I know if you guys ever gotten out of a car and you thought you cleared it and you get up and you kind of hit your head and you're like, oops. Well, to me, that's how your shot fake should look. So instead of just raising the ball, I feel like you should raise your body and almost like you're hitting head and it's abrupt. It's precise um, and it's strict uh, and allows the defender um, to react to these movements. Um, and talking about defense, we need as coaches to understand defense. We need to understand individually how people defend, right? We need to understand um, on ball perimeter defense. We need to understand post defense. We need to understand where contests are coming from. Um, and whether it's a weak side shell defense or pick and roll coverages on ball and off the ball. I became such a, I became a better player development coach as I understood defense. Uh, in, my, in my years coaching, coaching with Maine, uh, or even going back to my Oakwood years at high, in high school, Oak Collegiate was a really good defensive team and still is to this day. And I've been brought up on defense and it, with the Raptors organization, my first year, we were all about defense. Um, Coach Stackhouse was a big defensive guy and understanding all those things allowed me to understand what puts the defense in a bind. So the more I understood this, the more I became um, adamant about how we need to become better offensively in the offensive player, in these individual skills. And so we need to understand defense. And I will show a clip after this. And lastly, to help the skill acquisition is block versus randomized training. Okay, a lot of us have grown up a lot on block training. This is deliberate training. 
Um, in actuality, this is probably the best way to teach a skill. All right. You stand in a corner and shoot it over and over and over and over. All right. Um, I get the ball. I drive right. Right. I'm telling the player, I want you to drive right. When you get to this cone, I want you to go behind the back and then I want you to finish. You are telling the player exactly what to do, when to do it. And, and there's nothing wrong with this because we are now trying to teach the skill. In order to really transfer that skill into game-like situations, we need to do more randomized training, more randomized workouts that have variables, right? This is the game of basketball, and we play as much as we can to try and get those randomized and variable, um, variability to help our players get better, right? Whether that's one-on-one, two-on-two, all the way up to five-on-five. Five. And if you're doing it individual skill-wise, you know, you as your coach need to figure out ways to try and transfer that to the player um, and come up with as much creative and innovative ways as possible so that the player understands and um, the player can transfer these skills. Here, here, is, here is Shea again. He's coming off. And I talked about the analogy earlier, high five. As you can see, he comes off this DHO, and he gets right to the clip. Okay, so he shoots this floater right here. Now there's 10 seconds on the shot clock. Ideally, we want um, a better three in this situation, a catch and shoot three right here to the wide open guy, if you guys can see that cursor, okay? But he shoots the shot. If you see him shoot the shot, and I'll try to slow it down as much as I can, he high fives the rim with a floater, right? It's not necessarily flip, and it goes in. So that analogy of using a high five he uses in this situation, okay? Here, one of our rookies, PJ Washington, and this goes back to evaluation and understanding the player, right? And, and in our fundamentals and our ball handling skills, he catches the ball here, plays off the catch, and gets a charge. The best thing in this case, the best case scenario right here, I think would be to change direction. It would be to spin, go behind the back, right? So the next day, I'm going to take PJ and we're going to go work on this scenario, right? And earlier I, I talked about driving from the top, then going behind your back and then going to finish. Well, me as a coach, I'm going to get in front of him and I'm going to just tell him drive right. I want you to drive right and go finish. Now, if I cut you off, I want you to either go behind the back or spin. And doing six to eight reps of that, of him not knowing when I'm going to cut him off, um, allows him to start thinking what defenses are going to do. And this is a little bit more transferable to the game. And if you're not physically able to do those things, right, then you, you can well, – I've seen a lot of people use number systems. So if I say one, I want you to spin. If I say two, I want you to go behind the back. And you can say it right before that player gets to that point um, and try to use those things for – the thinking process to start making to, for the thinking process to happen and allows the player to make decisions. Decision making, just like we were talking about, and we're going to keep ta um, talking about that. We need to put our players in situations to improve reads. Uh, playmaking versus scoring. Do I score or do I pass? Right? Is this a pick and roll situation? or shell defense situation. All these things are incorporated in the decision-making of a player. And we as coaches need to try and figure out ways on how we do that. Choosing the type of finish at the rim is a decision. Whether I go off my right foot, my left foot, whether I do a Euro step or a floater, whether I'm using my inside hand or my outside hand, all of these things are decisions that need to happen. So if, if we go back to what we were talking about, block versus randomized training, right? We want to teach maybe two or three of these um, layups and then allow the player to do it, right, in the block training. Then we're going to allow them to do it in a randomized situation where, again, we can use the number scheme or we're using bodies as coaches, defenders, um, allowing them to make reads on these finishes. 
where if a player is going to go to the rim and make a layup, but then now you try to run and cut him off, now he's going to use the Euro step and finish. And as much uh, moves and finishes that you can think of, the more you can build on the variables that um, you can put into your drills to allow your players to get better. Here we have back, back to Shea. So I think he does a pretty good job here, one-on-one, -on -one, breaking down the defense. Okay, when he gets right here, this is where the decision happens. All right, so we talked about decision-making um, versus finishing or what finish to use, or is it playmaking versus scoring? Here is a scenario where Montrez comes up. He's trying to go finish um, block Shea's shot. And if you guys can see my cursor, you have a big here. So I need to be putting in the player's head, hey, you have a chance to throw a lob. You have a chance to kick it out for three. Again, you look at the shot clock when we're talking about analytics and the shot spectrum. Um, we probably want this floater last out of the five things that we want. But Shea decides to go all the way to the rim. So to me, the next day, if I was with him, I would be saying, all right, in this situation, we need to be looking for these type of passes. If we are going to score because the shot clock is winding down and we think Montrez is a great shot blocker, maybe we're going to use the floater in this situation. So as much as we can, using film to break down and then from there build our drills while answering the question why. Here we have Devontae, Devontae Graham. Okay, I talked about earlier understanding where the defense is going to be and the type of contest. So um, last year or coming into this year, um, me and Devontae sat down and we talked about one thing we can really, really add to his game this year to try and be um, exceptional. And one of them was shooting off the bounce from three. Um, so, and we compared it to the, the best players in in the NBA at, you know, the guard, point guards position that are doing this. So you got Steph Curry, Kyrie Irving, Kemba Walker, Dame Lillard. Um, sorry if I'm missing anybody, but th those jump out to me right now on guys who can make this three and make it consistently. So he comes off this pick and roll and he shoots this three. And we talked about the analytics earlier. Again, we're trying to avoid this, this shot right here early in the shot clock. You can see the big is back encouraging this, understanding that the defense is in the drop coverage, right? So making this shot, it needed to be practiced. Not only that, but we have a rear view contest, right? So you see, we have the rear view contest. So every day in the summer, I worked on with, I worked with Devante to try and make this shot, right? And it came from the head coach, uh, James Borrego, saying, yeah, he thinks this is okay and a good shot for Devante, and I got the clear, so now I'm going back and we're working on this, whether it's 50 times in a day, um, whether it's 100 times in a day, all different variations of it, and that's me screening for him and maybe having another coach rarely contest, getting that feel. Right? Those are the variables that we talked about in terms of the randomized uh, situations. And if you're just by yourself as a coach, you can screen, he goes by you, and then now you turn around and rarely contest yourself, okay? Another thing we did, I did with him is we would play one-on-one -on -one with two coaches, right? Or you can do it with a player. Um, and basically what I would do, we'd get a player to get into the ball. I would screen, I would use a pad, I would screen and see if these guys can get threes off with rarely contest. Um, so this allowed Devontae to get really comfortable with it, and he made a lot of threes this year. I think he was number five or number four in the NBA in, in three-pointers made. And a bunch of those were because of this scenario right here. Quantifying skills. Right. How do we determine if a player is getting better, right? There's feel and there's facts, right? And we talk about watching film. Right now we've dived a lot into – watching of the film. Um, I think some of these things that you can do is start to track. Let's track what these players are doing in games and what you're trying to improve when you're going back and you're watching the film, right? We're also getting the stats. Are they shooting 35% or 40%, right? 
And sometimes you need to break those down a little bit more. If Devontae shot 10 threes in the game and he made five out of 10, I want to know how much he made that were catch and shoot and how much he made that were off the dribble. The ones that he was, the one that he is better in, uh, let's say he's a 43% catch and shoot shooter or a 33% off the dribble shooter. I want to make sure that we're spending more time working on that 33%, but in game time also encouraging, hey, we need production from you that you need to err on the side of catch and shoot threes more. And this allowed to, you know, automatically for your percentages to rise uh, once you start to understand that in terms of quantifying. Um, and you can also put in place transferable drills. Okay. Now, sometimes with the transferable drills, this ends up being block training, like we talked about earlier, uh, but it's okay. You can still use it. It's just that we want to emphasize or we want to put in more random training. Um, for instance, um, 100 corner threes, right? You can shoot 100 corner threes a day to try and understand if that player is actually getting better at it, right? And you see right above it, I talk about player roles. Some guys are not going to be able to do this in a game because coach has um, coach hasn't deemed that player to shoot it. Um, I saw somebody raise their hand. I'm going to get to it right at the end of this clip. Okay. Uh, for example, Bismack Biombo has never shot a three in an NBA game. For me, I think he's capable of it. So how am I going to get my head coach to understand or feel comfortable in knowing that? hey, we're going to allow Biz to shoot corner threes. Well, I'm going to put him in a corner after we've worked on his mechanics and built his, um, his mechanics up to the point where he can shoot threes. I'm going to put him in the corner and shoot 100 corner threes a day. And we're going to make a goal and then say, you know what, Biz, if you make 70 threes out of 100, not one, but let's say five days in a row, I will go to the head coach and say, Biz has improved. Here is why, on average, and, and we should allow him now to take those shots in the game. It sounds crazy, but if a player is making 70 out of 100 threes and by himself, we need to try and figure out ways of how we can implement this into the game. And the first step would be, all right, well, let's, let, let's have him shoot him in practice when we're practicing five on five. So now that coach has... Um, hard copy of what he's shooting on a daily basis, where he was in December till now. Um, this now allow him to feel more comfortable and see it for himself. He's shooting it in practices. And then hopefully one day, if there a game situation happens, then he'll be allowed to shoot it. But this is allowing to give a player a nugget and something to work towards while still, um, and improving, expanding their game while still doing the things they do. Um, we had a question. Sure, yeah, Coach. The uh, question that comes up here, how much of this is player-driven? So uh, give the example of Biz. Does Biz come to you and go, okay, you know, Coach, I really want to work on my, my three-point game. Uh, can we spend some time working on that? And then you take that uh, to Coach Brego, or is it is it deemed a little bit more in the start of the season, hey, this is what we want for your individual performance plan as we go through? I think, um, I think it comes on – from different angles. So I think the head coach is going to say, hey, we think this player can do this. Let's try to implement that into their game, right? And this comes back to the evaluation piece as a coach. If you're a head coach, assistant coach, whatever it is, you always have to be able to understand how do I evaluate my players, all right? And, and, and see the ability. Once I'm able to see the ability, now I can step into a realm of, can we enhance that skill? Um, and sometimes players will come back from the summer and say, hey, I've been working with my trainer on this, and I'd really like to do that. Well, this guy has spent all that time, or this guy or girl has spent all that time working on something. And, if we're, and a lot of the times as coaches, we say, well, you're not going to do that here. Well, let's put a goal on it and say, if you can do this, then we can implement it over time. So I think sometimes it's coming from – the head coach in terms of how they want to run their system and the, the shots or things that that player needs to be able to do. 
right? And, and we're talking about shooting now, but it could be something like we need our fives to be able to handle the ball in DHOs at the top of the key a lot. So if a five is not comfortable handling the ball, then we really need to work on this ball handling and try to quantify how we can do those things um, to really improve. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, that was great, Coach. Thanks. Okay, as we move on, we're going to move on to uh, movement and strength. All right, and, and, and I, I've grown so much in this area. Um, and, you know, sports science is, is a part of us with the load management, understanding how to build a player. We have to kind of understand this, this circle. All right. When they come and tell us, hey, this player has these type of injuries, or they don't do, or they don't bend well enough, or um, you know the ankle mobility is not great. We as coaches need to hear this, understand this, and understand how to apply this on the court, right? So when I get them on the court now, and we're working on drills, and we're working on things that you want to implement into the game, we need to remember, you know, possible the biomechanics or you know injuries that they're dealing with. Right. And, and if that's the case, then we need to now there's an area where well, I feel like he doesn't explode going right as much as he goes left. Well, then I'm going to go to the strength and condition coach and say, can, can we work on this? And the strength and condition coach might do eight lunges to the right and six lunges to the left for the next couple of weeks, just so that maybe we're emphasizing something more, right? But now we go to the athletic therapy side and they're saying, well, he's not as explosive going right because his right ankle is super tight or his, his hip flexors in his right have been damaged and he really needs to work on it. So now, the therapy, athletic therapy is dealing with that hip. They're loosening it up. They're doing trigger point therapy. They're doing um, dry needling, whatever it might be to help loosen up that area. And then now after the assessments, feels like it's been loose. Now I'm taking them back on the court and we're going back to the strength and conditioning to reinforce that. And so everybody is on the same page on how this player is getting better. And I think that's very key that we touch all those pieces um, and I felt when I was working in the National Training Center in, in Canada, the national team, I thought we did a great job of that. We had a, we had a strength and conditioning coach, um, and we had athletic therapy, and we had, we had coaches on the floor. And we would meet once a week and talk about all the athletes and what areas of improvement. And so we knew where they were strength-wise, we knew where they were with their body, and we knew where they were in terms of quantifying their skills on the court. So we were always in the loop, making sure everybody was better. Next year, we have an example um, of PJ Washington. Again, I thought defensively on the perimeter, he wasn't great. So here he's kind of high waisted. He's a high waisted athlete and he's not really in the stance. And me as a coach, um, I really wanted him to be in the stance. And coach uh, Grego was big on, he needs to defend on the perimeter. Um, in the NBA today, a lot of switching is happening at the end of a shot clock or early in the shot clock. And you need to be sit down and be able to guard wings and guards. And I thought earlier in the season, PJ didn't do a great job of this. But again, it goes back to our circle. I'm going to say on court, we're going to work on getting low in a defensive stance, right? The drill may be, hey, PJ, I want you to be in a defensive stance. I want you to close out, get in a stance, guard one slide pop out, right, and then get a three. It's just something simple like that, just to reinforce these habits. And here, PJ's kind of up straight, not great job of sliding. Um, and you can see in the next clip, what I really liked about it, this was later on in the year, right here, he starts to get in the stance. Okay, he's guarding Carmelo. At least, this is where I froze it right here, if you guys can see that. I thought this was a great example of him being in a stance whereas before he was standing straight up all the time and I'm not sure if this was um him guarding post players a lot along you know along his career and understanding 
where he came from, and that's the evaluation piece, right? But we needed to improve this. And on this possession, he does a pretty good job of sliding with Melo, contesting the shot, and I thought he improved, and we felt more comfortable as a staff that we could um, – that we could allow him to switch with guards. The last piece that I'm going to talk about is constructing our workout. And so after we talked about building the player is how are we going to now get on the court and do this? Um, and I feel like for me, these are the things that I go through all the time, ball handling, finishing, shooting, defense and combination drills, right? Ball handling, whether it's stationary or on the move, finishing stationary or on the move, um, talking about block training and randomized training, right? All these things being implemented in each phase. Um, for the shooting piece, um, obviously, I think you got to start at the rim. You got to deal with form shooting, which is the everyday thing. You got to deal with form and move your way back and then all different five levels of shooting that I like to talk about all the time. Um, and uh, I'll get back and be, I'm pretty sure someone's gonna ask me that question. Um, but the shooting that's involved and then defensively, we need to imp imp apply more defensive drills within our workouts. All right, as coaches, if you tell a player, hey, I want you to work on some defensive slides, they're probably not gonna be very happy about doing that. But if you say, hey, we're gonna do three defensive slides, I want you to close out, do three defensive slides, um, challenge a shot, and then after you challenge a shot, I want you to sprint to the corner and you're gonna get three threes. I think a lot more players will be engaged about doing those things. Um, so I try to, when I'm, when I'm doing a workout, just in general, I try to do all those things. And then the combination drills is like a last piece. You can get a lot of cardio out of that. And by combination drills, I mean just putting everything in together. So you can start at half court. You can come down. You can break, break down a coach, get to the rim, and you can finish. All right? Once you, you finish at the rim, you can sprint to the corner. You get another shot. Then you can shake up to the wing. Right, and once you, once you shake up to the wing, you can drive again and get a mid-range area shot. Because he's in the mid-range, now he closes out and defends maybe for one or two slides and gets another shot. And to me, that, you know, you get four or five reps, you got a lot of things going on on the court, and this allows you um, to build up some combination, but you're reinforcing all the things that you taught that day. Um, so it just allows you to be innovative, but if you're covering these things just in a basic or a general workout, I think it's important. If you're, if you're cut for time, then, then you focus on areas that um, are probably of need from the night before, whether it's game, uh, like the one we talked about with PJ earlier, you know, driving to the corner, going behind the back, right? Or, you know, Devontae coming off that pick and roll, with a rare recon test shooting three. So um, that's just how I like to do it um, and try to build around it and try to keep it new and, and refresh drills and construct new drills and try to answer the question why while doing it. Perfect, Coach. We appreciate uh, you sharing. If, uh, if you're willing, we'll hit you with some questions as we go here now, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get it. Okay, fantastic. All right, first one up here for you, five levels of shooting. Five levels of shooting. Okay, so for me, I feel like there's guys who can shoot the ball, but they can't do all five things. Um, and when I mean can't, I don't like to say the word can't, but um, they're not as good at all five things. And uh, let's use a percentage. Let's say, can they do all five of these things at 40%? each in each category. So for me, there's the basic catch and shoot shot where your standstill, maybe it comes off a drive, kick, swing, like extra shot. And that would be, a lot of guys can do that. A lot of girls can do that, right? That's just standstill, something you practice your whole life. The next level to me would be basic movement. So this could be a corner shake to the wing, 
this could be a um let's oh you can go in reverse you can go from the wing and you're sliding to the corner on a baseline drive um those things or spacing i'm a point guard at the top of the key i hit somebody off a pin down and now i space to the wing right and i catch those shots so those are one to two three steps um that is basic movement and again i think people practice these things and they're capable of it but percentages drop from standing still to now moving two or three steps all right another level of shooting would be basic off the bounce and when i mean basic off the bounce this might be transition i'm bringing the ball up in transition and i'm wide open and i shoot a three um, i'm coming off a of pick and roll and the big goes on uh, and the guard goes under and I and I shoot a three. Um, I catch the ball on the wing or the corner and there's a guard coming by and I fly by and I shot fake and I take one dribble to the side, right? Whether it's a three or a pull up and I shoot that ball. Um, to me, those are the, they're hard, but they're the basic level of off the dribble shooting that a lot of people practice and numbers are are staggering in the NBA, uh, catch and shoot players versus off the dribble three players, right? And as coaches, we need to try and dive into how we can um, scout these players. And sometimes you might not overreact to things if you really, really understand that. Um, another level of shooting is, um, it's basically elite movement. So uh, elite movement, J.J. Reddick, Kyle Korver, uh, Steph Curry, you put them underneath the basket and there's floppy actions, pin downs, and they're flying off, you know, how Rip Hamilton, Reggie Miller used to do. This is elite movement. Um, Brady Heslip, Andy Routens, uh, these guys are, to me, the elite movement shooters, and there's not a lot of these guys left. Um, even if you look at the NBA, they attract a lot. Um, they allow your def they they cause havoc for your defense. Um, there's just not a lot of these guys anymore. So after you kind of get better at those other three levels, I think this is another level to try and get better at um, that is elite. And then the last one is the elite off the bounce. And I think this is um, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. You give them the ball one-on-one -on -one, and you say get me a three get me a three off the bounce. i'm down three they're switching everything at the end of a shot clock and i need to get a three off because we're down three and i decide to give you an in and out crossover step back contest make that shot now percentages drop on all these or they waver on all these some players are have three of them some players have two of them there's nothing wrong with that but it's it's like understanding when you call somebody a shooter is how many of these levels that they have, right? And, and if you have four of these, you're big time. In the NBA, I, thought, I, I can think of like five guys that might be able to do all five at about a 37 to 38%, right? You're talking about Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, um, I think Kemba Walker, Kyrie Irving, Dame Lillard, right? All, I'm talking about all five, right? So um, a guy like Kyle Korver, I think can catch, catch and shoot basic, right? Basic movement, um, basic dribble, you know, shot fake side dribble, um, elite movement. I'm not sure you can give him the ball and he can create a three one-on-one -on -one, um, and shoot it at a high percentage. I think he can do it, but that, I guess that explains all levels of shooting. That was perfect. It was a great way to break it down here for us too, both with player analogy and uh, and um, the levels. As you go through and you look at um, coaches uh, or teams who may not have a large staff, you know, what an NBA staff has, what advice would you have for, for player development? Say if you're at a high school, it might just be you and an assistant. You might not have an assistant. How would you incorporate that into your day-to-day? -day? Absolutely. I think these are the best times to um, really help develop the – uh, randomized training. So teaching your players how to be defense. Uh, if I explain, I explained the drill earlier with Devonte at the top of the key, right? He was at the top of the key 
And now I would have a player with the ball and another player setting a screen and another player defending, right? And, and now you can orchestrate a drill where there's three people involved and they can rotate it and get reps. And now you're also teaching defense, you're teaching screening, you're teaching the shooting technique that you want, right? Um, and I think those are, that's the best way to do it, is get your players involved as much as possible. And this is where the innovative um, skill has to happen as a coach as we get better and as we grow the game. Oh, perfect. Next one, um, do you have a set schedule for in, individual workouts or more on call during an NBA season? Um, with us, with the Hornets, we have something called vitamins. Um, so uh, and it depends on the day, obviously on a back-to-back, things like that. We're not going to do any vitamins. Um, but these are scheduled pretty much for days of practice, um, days of shoot-arounds where guys come in and they know they have this 20 to 25 or 30 minute blocks, you know, rookies are doing longer um, where they come in and get work. And so these are scheduled and, and, you know, with coaching, I think that you can schedule these things along with your practice. Um, other, uh, Nick Nurse calls it um, pre-practice, right? So as everybody starts coming in, they're already starting, they're ball handling, they're shooting, they're working on these things. They're implementing things, right? Um, here in Charlotte, we, we call it vitamins, and we're doing those things. I think the non-scheduled workouts come from sometimes the player wanting to come back at night, getting extra work, um, understanding our load and our schedule of practices and playing. Um, so we don't want to do too much at night, obviously, with load. Um, but there are days in the schedule like, okay, look, we play on Monday. We don't play till Thursday, right? So maybe Tuesday, um, Tuesday night would be a good night to come back and get an extra couple of reps in besides the practice work. And I think that's where every, every organization I've ever been, the guys who have done that once or two times extra at night, a, a night um, or a week have, have been the better players and they've, they've grown. Uh, then maybe a follow-up onto that. If you have 30 minutes with a guy in, in pre-practice or with vitamins, as you said, how much of that is block versus how much of that is random? So I think that the block part of the 30-minute workout that you need to do are teaching the skills that you feel you saw the night before or, 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 or things that you're still able to um, reinforce that what you've been doing. So Again, you always have to teach first, right? We're, we're teaching, we're teachers first. And then in order to apply it, that's where you start to add on to the, uh, the randomized training as well as the, the variables, which are sometimes the contest. I know at the NBA level, sometimes we have video guys and interns that can, that vary in size, 6'7", 6'4", 6'2". And if I get a player shooting and all these guys are contesting shots, they're getting variables of different length and contest that you actually do get in a game. And so you always can't have that, I get, at, at, the low, um, at a lower level. But this is just an example of how we try to create variability as much as possible. Sure. Coach, I like that you said no interns under six feet. That was good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> as we go into – um five, nine. Yeah. <laughs> Right on. As you go into um, the next one here, maybe differentiate uh, if there are much uh, between working with an NBA team to working with a national team in the role that you have. Um, for me, uh, there's there's not much besides maybe the rule changes. Um, but I mean, the biggest change will always be your head coach, right? For me, as a player development coach understanding what my coach wants to do offensively and defensively is how I need to adjust my player development. Um, so in both, in both cases, um, both really good coaches, I've been able to adapt in these areas um, of the training. So, and the FIBA style, right? You're making quicker decisions, right? You can't, as a coach, you can't call a timeout in the middle of a possession. Um, so you need to be learning even uh, where well, you need to be teaching these randomized and, and understanding, teaching these guys how to make reads even more, right? Because the playmaking that your players make are vital um, to the efficiency of your offense. 
And you can only do that if you're stressing those things in player development um, within the FIBA game that's affected by the timeouts that you can't call. Perfect. Um, next one for you. We hear maybe now more often the difference between skill development and player development. Um, in your opinion, is there a difference? And if so, what would it be? I think so. Um, because obviously skill, you're, you're right on top of the, the skill. I mean, I don't know if some people will call defense um, a skill, um, but I don't think reading, re a reading situation is – is a skill you're you're developing the player right the mindset to make that read so that's where i think i differentiate those things for example if i'm if i'm teaching a player to come off a pick and roll and as a big tags i want him to make the pass to the corner i need to be able to make sure that he can get in there and see when the when the guard or or somebody tags on the big rolling that he can make that pass so the player development piece is watching it on film and allowing that player to understand the read that needs to happen. The skill development would be me getting on the floor or working on ball handling and maybe passing with his left hand and his right hand. The reason why he's not able to make the read going left is possibly because he can't pass going left or with his left hand. So we need to improve the skill. And I think there's a lot of players sometimes who have a lot of skill but don't make the reads within the game. So I think the player development piece comes more from the reads um, and the decisions where the skill work is the ability. Oh, perfect. Coach, uh, I mean, from all of us, Golden Ticket Sports Basketball Version, really appreciate the time, really appreciate uh, the effort and the energy, both in preparing for this, but also what you've given to our country as well, repping it as well. We'll leave you with the final word today. And I just think, I feel like, again, uh, the – the player development piece is, is huge within our game. Um, it starts from the grassroots level. That's where I started. Uh, I would hope I, I gave enough nuggets today for everybody to get better. And I just really want uh, people to continue to get better in this area. If we get better in this area, our youth will get better, which then grows the, the game in our country. Um, so again, as much as I can give back, I would. Um, I really appreciate you guys for having me.